Greetings and welcome. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the introductory webinar for the Accountability Path 2.0 course. So I want to talk about what accountability actually is, what the essence of it really is today. When we think about accountability, of course, we typically think in terms of management, right? Holding someone accountable, being held accountable. And I'll talk about that later today, but I think it's important to, to be able to really get how Clear and Open sees accountability and how it can be most useful to you. It's important to understand, to start with a understanding essentially on a really deep, deep personal and even spiritual level what accountability is actually about. And I'll tell a few stories from my own life that are happening right now as a, a way of relating to that. So first, for those of you who uh, don't know who I am and where I come from, uh, uh, I've been a business and personal coach for uh, coming up on 18 years now, which makes me feel a little bit old. Um, it's been an amazing journey. I always say I've learned more from my clients than they have from me. And that's part of why I love doing what I'm, I do. It's always uh, a constant and um, deep way of learning about myself, life itself, humanity. And I would say 99% of the content I generate, including the accountability path, comes directly from working with people. So in that way, uh, while I have the role of a teacher, yeah, it's really my clients who are teaching me. It's, far more what the experience is like. Uh, I began at uh, the coaching, com coaching company called Emeth in 2002 and was, uh, they were one of the pioneers of business coaching back in the 70s. I joined there uh, again in 2002 and worked there for almost four years, then opened up my own practice for about six years. And then I returned to Emeth as an executive, wrote curriculum for them and uh, worked to help bring Emeth up to date with what I'd been learning. And then I went back to coaching. I live in, on the island of Maui on the north side with my two cats and two acres that I call home. And um, yeah, that sort of leads me into the story I want to talk about, I think. Um, so yeah, I've been coaching for 17 years and the context for this is going to be about accountability. I promise I'm not just talking about myself for no reason. So I've been coaching for 17 years and uh, I started to get a little bit of an itch. It's sort of right there on the corner of my nose. I get an itch to serve more people. As often happens, you know, when you get good at something, you want to sort of expand, um, not just in the money way, but uh, reaching more people, having more influence. It's a reasonable thing to happen when you think you know what you're talking about, right? So uh, I started for the first time experimenting with marketing about two years ago. And my practice had been fueled 99.9% .9 via referral. In fact, I don't think I spent even a dollar on marketing until I launched my first website I don't know, six years into coaching, five years into coaching. And then even then it was, you know, what, a hundred bucks a year for the hosting service. But I put very little investment into marketing. And I started to get, again, that itch to serve more people. And I also started to think, you know, like a business person ought to think. And I started to think, well, given that my um, lead source is entirely dependent on referrals, well, that's not actually very smart, is it? You know, if I were coaching a business and all of their leads were coming from one source, I would say, hey, you probably should have some other sources, right? Notice the word should there, right? It's an idea. It's not necessarily in reality. It's a decent best practice. It certainly would uh, cause someone to look at that, right? You'd be curious about having all of your eggs in one basket that way. But it, it was just an idea. So coaching, you know, when I started coaching, coaching was an unusual thing, not accepted like it is today. Today, there's uh, a new coach born every minute, it seems, to coin a phrase. 
And uh, now coach training is a really enormous uh, industry growing every day. <clears throat> and it's become very popular for people to have coaches, right? So now, uh, you know, I watch social media arise and, you know, uh, text cards with clever quotations and all of this stuff happened. And I'm watching it going, well, I've been coaching long before all of this came around, so I guess I should join the fray, right? So that was two years ago. And um, in this moment, I feel kind of happy to say that it hasn't really worked at all for me. I don't know why I feel happy about it. I think because I'm finally just accepting that. It's been a terrific experiment. And the, where, where do I start with this? What it's shown me most is a kind of reaching dynamic in me that shows up in a lot of areas of my life as these kinds of themes and dynamics tend to. But this reach in me, this reach for more, um, I've been an athlete and an academic and an overachiever since I was a kid. There was always this sense in me of more, more, I'll be happy when, right? When I achieve this, then I'll be who I want to be. When I show everyone I can do this, then they'll see me. And then, of course, what happens, because I'm, I'm sure some of you have this dynamic to some degree. It's very classic among Americans, for sure. But I think it's common in the, in the modern age in general. This We're encouraged to reach for more. And there's a lot of great things about that, of course. It pushes us toward excellence, and we get to find out what we're made of. But there are limits to it as well, because if you identify, if you place your happiness, your fulfillment conditionally on some future event, right? When I'm an Olympic figure skater, when I'm a collegiate springboard diver, when I am first in my class at Harvard, whatever that is, then it automatically makes you miserable to some degree now, doesn't it? Have you noticed that? That when you place your fulfillment in the future, it has to take away from your fulfillment right now. And that's a really tricky thing then, because you might have the question, well then, if you don't do that, then how do you have goals and dreams and whatnot? There's a way, but I don't have talk, time to talk about it today. It's a subtle shift in how you relate to yourself and to life, actually, and it fits in with accountability as we'll talk about today. So there I was, this overachiever being like, well, I've been coaching a really long time. I think I know some stuff about it. I've trained coaches. I should have a wider audience. I'll create this membership thing. I'll be able to serve more people and I'll advertise that. And of course, people will want to do it. Well, what it taught me was where I was reaching and exactly how I suffered by having this picture about how things should be. Because life did not cooperate with uh, the picture I had about how things should be. Um, don't get me wrong, the practice is doing quite well compared to most coaches. Um, but the advertising, the marketing, the spreading the word, and the growth that I had in my mind, that didn't happen at all. And uh, I didn't put a lot of time and expense and energy into it, but it definitely was a project. You know, and it took away from other things. So I've been left with this consternation, kind of mild frustration, sometimes more than mild. What's the deal? What am I supposed to do here, right? I've got a lot of great content. And the people I do serve get a lot out of what I bring. Why is it that marketing is not working? Do I need to do different things? Do I need to put more money into it? Do I need to do more targeting? Do I need to get more clear about who my customer is? All of that. And then I started listening more carefully. I started to notice the frustration in me because I know that's sort of an artifact of the reach. There's a reach for something, it doesn't happen, and then there's frustration about it. And then I returned to reality. And I said, well, what, what do I know to be true? What I know to be true is for 17 years, I've run a very successful coaching practice with no advertising help at all. It's been entirely by referral. That's reality. And then I had this idea that it should be different than that. 
I should also be able to get leads somewhere else. So again, important to look here. Reality, referrals are working for you, always have been. Idea in my head, I want that to be different. Nothing wrong with that. The, the building you're standing in right now started out as an idea. Sometimes ideas turn into reality. Sometimes they don't. The difference there is accountability. You see what I mean? We generally don't think of accountability that way. But what I would offer is my interpretation of what's been going on is that life has been holding me accountable. And life said, not that that's a bad idea, because I learned a huge amount about myself, patience, fortitude, finding different voices in me and meeting people where they are, dealing with the story I got from my childhood, from the way my parents um, didn't give me everything I needed, the issue of, well, the world won't listen, which is a projection from my parents, this kind of neurotic need to be listened to that definitely helped me become a teacher because I got really good at making it easy for people to listen to me, but there's a shadow side of everything. So the quote unquote failure of that project, the marketing project, was quite instrumental in being a mirror for me to look in so that I could see all of these shadow themes that need to be listened to, the desire to be famous, because what would that give me? Well, some part of me would then be able to rest, like, oh, okay, I'm not crazy, the voice would say, you know, if a significant amount of people, listen, you know, I finally get that TED talk or whatever. There's this imagination that some part of me would be able to rest. Okay, I'm not crazy. My ideas are not nuts. I belong. I fit in, which is exactly the feeling I did not get in my family of origin. You see? So in one way, you could imagine it was actually perfect that my marketing project did not work, that that's actually what I needed, you see, in order to deal with all this stuff. Because if it had worked, and by working we mean was successful, right? If it did go the way I wanted it to, then I would still be on that wheel, that gerbil wheel of, oh, well, you know, when I get an audience of 20,000 people, then I'll feel this way. And then, of course, what happens? You get to that 20,000 people and most likely it doesn't touch that thing you're looking for, right? Oh, well, then maybe it's 40,000. Well, maybe it's 100,000. Well, maybe it's if it's I sell 2 million books or 10 million books or whatever. That's the reaching. So what I would say is that life brilliantly held me accountable by planting a seed in me that said, hey, why don't you try to reach more people? See how that goes. But the point was not to reach more people. The point was to reach into myself rather than reaching to the outside. So while all this was happening, that was one form of accountability that's been happening. So now while all this has been happening, uh, I was divorced about five years ago and have the longest relationship I've had since five years ago has been two months. And the ones besides those, that two months one was, uh, and they've all been in the less than one month category. So I've been basically single for five years. And um, it may not surprise you to hear that there's a part of me that really doesn't like being single for the very same reason as what I was talking about with the, the true of the marketing thing. There's this reaching thing, this desire to belong, this desire to connect that comes from some of uh, what was missing in my childhood. And, um, you know, add that to most of my life I've spent in uh, romantic relationships. And so this five years was the longest time I was single in my adult life by about four years. It was a really long time for me. So like, you know, five was that 500% longer than ever before. So the same kind of dynamics came up. And by the way, all this just came to me this morning, I, the clarity of it anyway. That's the beauty of getting to do a webinar, forces you to get clear. So all, it pushed up all of the same stuff. Um, I 
need this. Hey, life, I need this thing. I need this kind of client, this kind of partner. It was all the same, this kind of reaching. And when I'm not, uh, when I'm single, the same kind of stories. I don't belong. Uh, I'm too different because I am a kind of unusual person, which to, to put it kind of lightly. And then all this fear comes up. It's like, well, maybe I'm just too weird a person. I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. And there were probably a good six, eight, maybe even 10 moments of just total surrender, giving up. And each time I gave up and returned to myself, I don't need anyone to be fulfilled. It's just between me and me and me and life. Each time that happened was another layer because each time it happened, it felt so complete. Like, wow, this is really self-reliant, self-loving feeling. I think I'm really okay. And then inevitably in a couple of months, the longing would come back and another layer would, uh, would um, need to be processed. So that went on for five years. The most recent letting go and giving up uh, was probably in uh, June or July. And it was a deep one. I, I never felt more okay with myself, as myself. And it became really clear to me that because every time that happened, it was like a deeper level of like, oh, this is what self-love means. This is what self-reliance means. Like I'd only heard about this concept, but like this deep okayness with being single and not needing that to change, a, a deep acceptance of what is. And when I would reach those places, it would I would just kind of laugh to myself and say, wow, how perfect that I've got to be single all these years because I would never have reached that place of deep peace and acceptance and fulfillment and it's hard to put words to. Self-authority is a big piece of it. And that was that could not have happened without life holding me accountable by keeping me single. And in case you were wondering, was I making efforts to meet people and not be single? Yes, I was. And that had the same feeling and the same result of the marketing I was doing uh, of Clear and Open. A lot of energy and hope. The other side of the coin of hope is always hopelessness. So then there's hope, hopelessness, hope, hopelessness. It was like a washing machine. And it cleaned out the shadow aspects of me that were trying to argue with reality. And then an amazing thing happened last month on August 11th. I met a woman when I really wasn't trying at all. I'd really forgotten in the most unusual place on a kind of spiritual quest in Peru. Just she happened to be the person who owned the retreat center that a uh, group of us were using. And my intention on that trip was had a, had nothing to do with meeting someone. It's like you don't expect to meet someone in a you know a bizarre circumstance like that, but that's how it happened, right? And then of course we hear this story all the time. Well, you know, you meet someone when you're least expecting it, least looking for it. But what what is typically not said about that is how to arrive at that place, right? You arrive at the place of not looking for it by processing your whatever neurotic need you have to alter reality. You see what I mean? So again, the context of all this here is to consider that accountability is a fundamental aspect of life itself. So I'm telling you a couple of personal stories of myself to illustrate this frame because we generally don't think of accountability coming from life. We think of accountability coming from our boss or the cop who just pulled you over, or when you're a kid, your parents, or possibly when you're an adult, your parents. We don't think of accountability as being between you and life. But what if it is, right? What if the zebra who has some dream, perhaps, of a long and fulfilling life and reproducing and migrating around and whatnot, that zebra one day gets sick and then gets picked off by a lion? because a sick zebra invites the lion. That's how it works. 
That's the accountability. We live in a world where consequences for our actions are so constant that perhaps that's why we don't see it so clearly. Every action has a consequence. Every single one. And if you start to look carefully at how those actions and consequences line up, most importantly, I would say, is to look at where the consequences of your actions cause you pain and suffering. Because pain is the greatest teacher there is. Pain taught me how to be alone. Pain taught me how to trust life. Pain taught me how to be okay with reality because when you go against the grain of reality, it hurts. Have you noticed? It hurts. When you put your hand on a hot stove, it hurts. That pain is information. It's critical information. It's information you need so that you know not to put your hand on a hot stove because if you ever put your hand on a hot stove, you will never do it again because you felt the pain. You took in that pain as a teacher. That pain is accountability. You do this, X action causes Y consequence. So what I offer is that this is happening with everyone at all times from life itself. And most of the time, we're not listening. I wasn't listening much in these themes over the last five years. And so life, I mean, I would say I was listening about a third of the time and then arguing the other two thirds. And it ground me down like water against a rock until finally I gave up. And I wouldn't have traded the experience for the world, although the, the crushing level of loneliness, aided and abetted by the fact that I'd moved to Maui five years ago, never having moved somewhere where I didn't know anyone, boy, that was an, an experience of aloneness that I did not expect. And looking back on it, I would say it was critical. It's changed the way I relate with people, the way I relate to myself. And what I've learned from that is making the promise of this new romance promising <laughs> because the old, as we all know, the kind of reaching patterns of being too needy or um, overly attached or all that kind of stuff. Well, that destroys relationships faster than just about anything, doesn't it? Right. So the question I have for you to begin to consider is how has, how is, or how has life been holding you accountable? What's it trying to teach you? Because if you look back over enough years, you're going to be able to see how it's been holding you accountable. Surely you could, you know, look back at your early twenties, your first job, your first girl or boyfriend, first apartment on your own, you know, your first car, did you forget to change the oil for a few years and life held you accountable in that way? And maintenance is a really good example. All of the stuff we have, it requires maintenance, doesn't it? Like, how about teeth? I just saw my dentist a couple of days ago and I was thinking about accountability there. If you don't take care of your teeth, you will be held accountable, won't you? And it doesn't even take very long. If you don't exercise, you will be held accountable. If you don't eat well, you will be held accountable. We don't think of this kind of stuff as accountability, but isn't that really what it is? It's a kind of boundary, right? If you don't sleep enough, you will be held accountable. If you decide you don't feel like working, you will be held accountable, right? By your utilities, your mortgage company, your landlord, whatever it is. Accountability is everywhere. And then what notions do we have about freedom, right? If you ask a thousand people what freedom is, the vast majority, and I've been testing this for years, most, of, most people will say freedom is getting to do whatever I want, whenever I want. It's a lovely idea, isn't it? Freedom, do whatever you want, whenever you want. That's what the, 
people who do webinars like I do, they promise that, right? You can make a million dollars a month at home, right? You can have these kinds of things. You can own islands. You can have all of what you dream about. No responsibility. Do you know anyone like that? And if you think about it for a little bit, does it seem possible? Isn't it true that the more money you have, the more responsibility you have? Someone's going to manage that, right? Uh, here on Maui, uh, you may know Oprah Winfrey owns quite a large estate up uh, about 30-minute drive from where I'm standing right now. And I have some friends who have uh, at different times worked uh, on her staff doing different things. I have one friend who uh, is becoming the head beekeeper for, I guess Oprah has a bunch of bees, you know, which is an interesting job. And there's a staff, you know, I don't know how many acres she has. I think probably 30 or 40. She's been sort of buying up houses all near one area. So it's sort of a ranch, but she's got a staff of like 30 or 40 people. Can you imagine how expensive that is? And then who's managing them? You know, there's going to be someone at the top, but, you know, eventually that hierarchy ends somewhere, right? Oprah's got to be managing the head, the head Maui manager person, right? That person needs to be spoken to regularly. There's a relationship to upkeep. Oprah's got to ask questions, what's going on? How are things going? You know, I mean, sure, the thing could be automated in lots of ways, but you're never free of that, right? And I'm sure Oprah has lots of property in other places. And each one of those things is, a project. It's a lot to manage. So Oprah, last I heard, I don't know if she still is, but was the wealthiest woman in the world. Sounds like she has a lot of responsibility, right? I also had the um, pleasure of getting to be in Peter Thiel's house at one point. He's the um, co-founder, was, was the co-founder of PayPal, billionaire, more money than, than Oprah. And, uh, I happen to know he's got 10 houses around the world and uh, uh, he's got staff too, right? You can imagine. He's got a house right on the water, the windows, they have to be cleaned every month. Otherwise they get destroyed in the house right on the water. Maintenance, right? Accountability, it's everywhere. So this idea of freedom that we have, of being able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, Check into yourself for a moment. Is that your idea of freedom? Is that what some part of you is seeking? Because I've got some good news and some bad news, if that's the case. And the good news and the bad news is the same. That notion of freedom has no referent whatsoever in reality. It does not exist. It is not attainable. In other words, it is a childlike fantasy. And that's actually where it comes from. We only crave freedom like that, that boundless, total lack of responsibility, freedom without boundaries. Where that comes from, you might ask, it's like, okay, well, if no human being actually can attain that, then why do I have that? Reasonable question. You have that because your childhood wasn't perfect because children are supposed to be given that experience of total freedom to just be exactly where they are without having any responsibility. But to the degree we don't get that at various stages in our childhood, we grow up with that fixated need. We just want to be free. And so we have this oppositional relationship to boundaries precisely because we weren't perfectly parented. No one was. So in other words, it's a childhood fixation, that does, that, the desire for that kind of freedom. So how does that show up in adult life? Resistance to boundaries. Because you have this subtle, unconscious filter, this lens that says, I'll be free when there are no boundaries, which is impossible. Well, that, as you can imagine, is a recipe for suffering, isn't it? Because you're pursuing something that you can never have. And this is a way that most people are looking. It's a pair of glasses they're looking through without even realizing it. And it takes a fair amount of work 
to deconstruct that and learn how to surrender to the boundaries inherent in life itself and in your life itself. And when you can do that, you can start to actually listen to what life is trying to teach you. Because life, there's an intelligence in life that I'm sure you've experienced to varying degrees. There's an intelligence in life. It knows better than you. And it is an absolute authority. It is an absolute authority. It cannot be negotiated with. If it's sunny, it's sunny outside right now. It's not negotiable. That's what it is. If the marketing that I do doesn't work, it's not negotiable. That's what it is. And you don't have to like it. But the more you accept it, the more you can go with it. And the more you can walk the path that life is giving you. Now, this is threatening to most people's egos because the ego likes the idea that we're in total control of our own lives. And this is what most people in my industry sell. You are the author of your life. Anything you put your mind to, you can accomplish. And it's not that those ideas are not useful because they absolutely can be, but they're not absolutely true. I'm just under 5'10 and 140 pounds soaking wet, and I'm 45 years old. I can put my mind to being an NBA all-star. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's impossible for that to happen, but it's extremely unlikely, isn't it? If I got in my mind that that's what I wanted to do and I went for it, I would probably learn a whole lot through that failure. So who's to know, like, how do you call it a failure? Depends on what you mean by it, right? If you learn the lesson, there's no such thing as failure. In fact, you know, if you're paying attention after enough turns around the sun, you eventually realize that it's through failure that we learn the most. So to me, accountability is a mechanism. It's the mechanism for how we learn. Accountability is facing the music of reality and asking ourselves, what is life trying to teach me? You probably know someone in your life who has been learning a lesson very slowly for a really long time. Maybe they marry the same person three, four more times. They keep making the same kind of business mistake. They've been operating in total overwhelm ever since they graduated college. They keep treating people badly and then wonder why they get betrayed or whatever. This happens all the time. So it's not a matter of whether or not life is holding you accountable. It is. And you have no power over that. That's not up to you. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or the intelligence of life or whatever. All you got to do is look. It's irrespective of your belief. And you can tell yourselves a hundred thousand times a day that you are the author of your own life. That won't make it so. The same way saying it's raining won't change the sunny day behind me. So the power you have, paradoxically, is in surrendering to the lesson. Allowing yourself to be held accountable. And it, it took me five years of surrendering again and again and again to finally be like, okay, I'm alone. I accept it. And then a couple months later, she showed up. Or at least so it seems. Who knows? Maybe this is another lesson. Too soon to tell. <laughs> Definitely too soon to tell. But uh, all green lights. So that's where the power you have is, paradoxically, not in self-authoring your life, ultimately. That's important too. But the greater and less appreciated power is in listening to what life's trying to teach you. 
Because the difficulty, the paradox is, of course, we can't just sit on the couch and say, well, I surrender to life bringing me whatever it wants to bring me. Life does not reward that. We have to do something. We have to follow our dreams, desires, instincts, and whatnot. And then we listen and see, we see what happens. Okay, I got this dream to become a pilot, a basketball player, a whatever. And then you follow it. And then you listen. Does life reward you for that? Is it going well or is it not? And that's what we're not good at as a species. That's what we're not good at. Now, that's the frame for this course. When you're not good at that, your relationship to what is that? Your relationship to the ultimate authority, life's intelligence, and how you allow accountability to guide you in your life, between you and life. When you're not good at that, or, or I should say, to the degree you're not good at that, you will translate that meta-macro accountability relationship into local micro accountability relationships. When you manage people, when you parent people on that side, or when you are managed by someone or coached, if you're working with a coach like me, because that there's accountability there as well. In other words, what I'm saying is your existential, we could call it existential accountability, your relationship to existential accountability, the accountability you have as a human being to life's plan for you, life's intelligence, the way of things, that relationship inevitably is going to translate down into micro accountability relationships you have. And this is why most managers have no idea what they're doing. This is the root of it, one of them. Because management is hugely governed by accountability and that individual's relationship to accountability is flawed at the very level of essence. Because when you hold someone accountable, what better model is there for how that works than how life does it? Because that's like the way, right? The same way when the Wright brothers were working on designing wings to create a plane, they looked at birds' wings. Good idea, right? Hmm, how did the birds do it? Because life figured that out. It works. So let's copy that. And of course, there's myriad examples of such things. How does life do it? How does life do accountability? Life can teach you how to manage if you pay attention to how it's managing you. So the model that I created called the accountability path, I wouldn't say I created it. It's more like I discovered or codified it because to me it looks like it's already there, just like the bird's wing. And it's relatively simple but in order to utilize it effectively, you got to make a change on the inside of you. And let me talk for a couple of minutes about that. Because in my industry, there's an enormous amount of selling of tools. Use this tool, this five step, it's a five step thing. I'll talk about it in a second. Five steps to blah, 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 right? Five steps to you know, having a million dollars to getting your employees to listen to uh, having a business that runs without you. And that's all marketing. I've been coaching almost 18 years and I'm here to tell you tools don't work unless the person has a clean relationship to whatever the dynamic is that needs to be to use that tool. I use the martial arts example a lot for this one. You can be really good at martial arts. You can have polished techniques, but if you're on the street and you get attacked and you panic, they're all out the window. You lose your balance. You get scared. Your techniques go to hell. Why is this? Because the being of who you are, how you're showing up, the energy, your level of groundedness, focus, etc., because that's prior to what you do. That's just how being human is. Who you are matters more 
than what you do. And who you are colors what you do. So I've taught the accountability path to many, many people. And what I've seen through experience, that doesn't surprise me because I see it with all the tools that I teach, is that almost never does it work without them making some kind of internal shift. You know, one of my earliest mentors 17 years ago said to me, the tools we learn in this industry called coaching, the tools are really just a framework to have the conversations that need to be had. Absolutely brilliant. I wish I'd thought of it. The tools are just a framework to have the conversation that needs to be had. The accountability path that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes and is the subject of this course in one way. It's just a framework to have the conversations that need to be had. It is not a system that's going to save you from anything. It's a system that will bring you face to face with your self authority issues, your relationships to your own power, your relationships to accountability with life, your emotional discomfort in having uncomfortable conversations with people. Those are probably about two thirds of the kinds of things that get in the way. Because if you're a manager, you're either too hard or too easy on your people, inevitably. It's usually one or the other. And the reason you're either too hard or too easy on people is, has to do with your relationship to accountability with life itself. And in this course, I'm going to experientially guide you to look square in the face of that so you can change it. And it won't be easy. And it's not going to be some passive education exercise. You're not going to just read a bunch of stuff and just go, aha, I'm going to give you exercises, soul searching exercises to do that will radically change your life if you take it seriously, because we're talking about your relationship with life itself. And when that shifts or when you use that shift to also change the way you're held accountable by other people and the way life is holding you accountable, i uh, sorry, the way you hold, you're held accountable by people and other people hold you accountable. When you connect the macro to the micro, therein you can become a powerful leader because what does a leader really do? A leader is just a messenger with accountability. A leader doesn't decide when someone's not doing their job. They're already not doing their job. The leader is the person who has the guts to say, you're not doing your job. And most managers I work with seem to take far too long to point out that reality. They delay being that messenger. Spiritually speaking, you could say they're at odds with reality right? If you're a manager, you know this one. Oh, so-and-so is not working out. Oh, crap. I don't want to have to rehire this person or I don't want to have to manage them more. I don't want to have to have another uncomfortable conversation. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. That's resisting reality. You see? That's not letting reality be your teacher. That's stomping your feet and saying, but I don't want to have to eat broccoli to your parent life. And when there's a delay there, if that's 100% longer than it needs to be. I was just talking to a CEO last night who has been delaying having a conversation with one of his VPs for like a year that he really doesn't belong in his job. That's too long for where you want to get to go, right? What is the gap between the reality that you see and you acting on it? That's the embodiment gap. When you close that gap, things go your way. Why? Because you're going life's way. But when you think you know better than life and make excuses like, oh, I guess he's not that bad and I don't have time to rehire or I don't know how that conversation would go well, you're making excuses and you're telling life you know better than it does. And how do you think that's going to go? Well, life says, and this is easy to observe, Life says, hmm, they don't get it yet. I guess I'll cause them more pain to see if they'll wake up, right? Because they've still got their hand on the stove. Obviously, it doesn't hurt enough. So you just invited life to cause you more suffering so that you can wake up. And life's very patient. 
more patient than you are. It, if you play a game of chicken with life, it wins every time. Is that surprising? It's got more pain. It's got more clever ways it can come up with to wake you up than you have to ignore the truth. That's how it is. Surrender or suffer. So uh, let me talk about just the, the accountability path itself here. It's five steps, but again, I want to really have the course be significantly about looking at your relationship to accountability along with, and that's going to be probably about two thirds of it. One third of it is going to be about the logistics of, um, you know, how to be the messenger of accountability. But what I would offer is when you open up and see how life is holding you accountable, that automatically changes the way you're held accountable by people and the way you hold people accountable. It just happens automatically. That's how it has been for me. That's where this came from. So again, it's about making the internal shift more than having another new tool in your head, even though both are required. So there are five steps to the accountability path. The notice the nudge, the talk, the carefrontation, and the line. And the idea behind this is that it's like a dial where the heat gets turned up. The notice and the nudge, it's important to name, and we'll use a manager-employee uh, example here um, as a frame. In the notice and the nudge, there's no assertion of authority, and that's really important. One of the mistakes that managers tend to make is that their first broaching of a subject, let's use the employee showing up late, common one. And what typically happens is that a, a manager won't say anything about that, and they won't say anything about that, and they won't say anything about that until it gets really frustrating for them. And then they have the sit down, right? We got to talk. You've been showing up late for a while and it's got to stop and yada, yada, yada. Well, what happens in such cases is the employee feels ambushed because this is the first they heard of it and the employer, the manager, is bringing frustration because what's going on is in the manager, the manager has been in their imagination talking with the employee about it for weeks. The employee just heard about it. So you see they're on different pages. So the remedy for this is the notice. And it's, it is right, just like it sounds. Hey, I noticed you came in 15 minutes late this morning. That's it. Could be followed with, is everything okay? But there's no disciplinary action. There's no uh, authoritative vibe to it whatsoever. In fact, it needs to be very much not that. Because what's going on here, the dynamic of it, and we'll go deeper into this, how to do a good notice, because each one of these steps is an art. The art of it is to communicate that you're noticing and to see what they do with it. You're not asking for them to do anything differently per se. Um, you're not coming down on them in any way. You're just noticing it so that they notice. You're finding out whether they knew that or not. Maybe they didn't even know. And then you see what they do with that. You're giving them room to make their own change, which is, have you noticed, exactly what life does, right? Life doesn't come down and, you know, etch in stone before you, uh, you know, what your to-do list needs to be during the day. You make that. And where you mess up and you don't prioritize the right thing, you get feedback about that, don't you, right? You get to have the authority to live your own life and then you have to deal with the feedback that life gives you. So then the second step is what I call the nudge. And the nudge is what you do when one or two or three or four notices, depending on how important the issue is, haven't worked. And the nudge has a little bit more push to it, but not much. It's still not an assertion of, assertion of authority. So it might sound like, hey, I've noticed you've come in late a few times last week. Do you notice that too? So there's a little bit more of a, I'm wanting you to get something here, but it's not a sit down, it's not a formal, we need to talk kind of thing, and it shouldn't feel that way. 
The nudge is what you do when the person isn't noticing. So you just turn it up just a little bit. Ask a question like, do you notice that? Is everything okay? I'm a little, con- should I be concerned? That's a good question. Should I be concerned? And it's giving them more data. Hmm. Because, you know, an employee who's paying attention should be like, hmm, my boss just pointed out that I've been late three times in the week. I should probably do something about that. But you're still giving them the freedom to do something with it. And the reason is because if you start telling them what to do too soon, you've disrespected their self-authority and they will only hate you for that, but only always. Why? Because that's not how life works, you see? Life respects our self-authority so much, we can be doing exactly the wrong thing and it doesn't stop us, does it? It brings consequences, it brings pain, but it respects our self-authority, you see? We have an enormous amount of freedom to make a lot of choices. And then we find out what the right choices are through experience. So as a manager, you're wanting to emulate that because that's what life does. That's how the bird's wing flies, right? Why would you try to reinvent it? If the nudge doesn't work, then it's on to the talk. And the talk is a sit down. But it's a sit down where you want to occur as a coach where you're on their side how can i help you the job needs you to be here the business needs you to be here at 8 a.m you've been coming in 8 15 how can i help and there's a structure for this that i'll go into in the course but the energy is really important it's coming from a how can i help place because as soon as you say to an employee hey i need to talk to you in my office they're already authority but they were already authority projecting on you to begin with they already compare you to your their mother their father the jerk of a uh, algebra teacher they had in middle school whatever that's already happening so this is one of the topics for the course we're going to be is talking about is how to undermine and dissolve these authority projections how to recognize them and how to make them go away because your employees are already afraid of you, whether they realize it or not. And then that fear is operating. So you have to be very intentional about uh, undermining it or uh, melting it so that you can actually have a, a mature conversation. So that's step three is the talk. And that that's, again, it's, it's more of a coaching conversation. You're, you're there to help, but it is a in-depth conversation about what's going on and how to, how you can help change it. Step four is what I call the care confrontation. Now the care confrontation, notice this is step four. This is the first time you really assert your authority as a manager. Hence the confrontation part of the care confrontation. This is where you start saying things like, if this doesn't change, we're going to have to take steps. Or if you're, going to work out here in the long run. This needs to change. It's the same structure as the talk with a different energy. And again, I'll go into the structure in the course. But the important thing that I really want to highlight here is that the assertion of authority is a last resort because of how people react to that. And then the last step is the line. And the line is the ultimate assertion of authority. That's when nothing has worked before. And you say, basically, look, there's no more coaching here. I've tried to help you. And uh, we're at the end. We're at the end of the line. This changes. You've got 30 days or we're done. And um, the idea here is that the person has been given every opportunity to make them change, make the change themselves under their own power because that's where change really happens. And the manager is supporting from underneath and avoiding this talking down to, talking at thing. And many managers will do that early on and they sabotage the change. Life doesn't do it that way. Life doesn't hold people accountable accountable that way. It's about using the assertion of authority as the last resort. That's how you maximize the ability to help people change. And the course begins a week from today. There are different ways to participate with it. Uh, if you're not already a clear and open member, membership is $129 a month. There are specials that can save you a few dollars on that. But basically, you're looking at about 300 bucks for um, uh, three months. The, the course is officially going to be eight weeks, but there'll probably be some bonus stuff on the end of it. 
And I want to be really clear about that. I want to be clear about how unclear that is. Um, the way I do these courses is they're custom designed for the people who are there. And um, that's how the, my, my favorite music that is performed, that's how, uh, that's how those musicians play. They play to the room. They play to the people that are there. And I'm not interested in doing lectures. This is a lecture, obviously. The course will not be made up of lectures. The course is going to be interactive. It's going to be very workshoppy. And I'm going to help you work on your relationship to accountability with life itself, help you see what that is. I can help you see how life, I mean, really, one way of saying what, what a good coach does, I think, is they help a person. Well, I don't know. Most coaches don't do this. This is something I've just been learning about myself, about what I really do. I help people see how life is trying to teach them something. And I try to wake them up to that. Because who am I to say what someone should learn or how someone should be? I'm just me. Your destiny, who you should be and where you're going is between you and life. So what I do when I work with people is I want to know where their pain is and I, know, I want to know what their dreams are. Because if you know how to look, you can sort of extrapolate from that and read how life is working with you, how life is working with that person. Because the dreams are just seeds that get you to take action. And the pain is information that you're off track. So the dream may be the right dream, I mean, it's always right in one way or another. Whatever you're pursuing, you're going to learn something from. Whether it's in content and you actually become the NBA player or whatever, or it's in context and you fail at that and that's what the learning is. But the role of a good counselor, advisor, therapist, whatever, if, they're really, if they really get what the work is about, and it only took me about 17 years to get this, is that has nothing to do with you as the coach. It's my job to help you learn better from you're the ultimate teacher, which is life and what it's trying to teach you. The biggest challenge in accountability that I see in people, it's losing the excess sense of control that you have. Because if you start to see how life is holding you accountable, then you realize how little control over your life you actually have. And that's a process and it can be challenging. But the reward is a freedom within boundaries rather than without that is beyond description. Because you think, how do I say this? The illusion of control that you have seems powerful, but it's actually suffering. Because it's like you're taking responsibility for your life in ways that it's not. Where you think, Outcomes are up to you rather than investing in what you want and then just seeing what happens. And so the attachment that we get when we think we're supposed to be able to control our outcomes, it causes a great deal of suffering and it takes a ton of energy. And so when you learn to let go and listen to life and let it guide you, everything gets so much easier. So in the meantime, whether you continue with the course or not that begins next week, have in the back of your mind, just listen. What is life trying to tell you? What is life trying to tell you? It's probably one of the most powerful questions you can ask. And if you listen for it and start to look at the signs and certainly the pain in your life, it will guide you to your own fulfillment, but usually not the way you think. Therein lies the rub, they say. All right. Thanks for listening and watching, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. Aloha. Bye for now.